Hello, party people, and welcome to another episode of Office Hours, live in the house this time. Uh, and most of the Office Hours that I do are asynchronous these days. I record them off somewhere else uh, and then give you scenes of different places uh, around wherever I'm at. But I thought, hey, I just actually woke up from a nap, and so I thought, why don't I uh, go through some of the questions? Because y'all have piled up a lot of questions, especially with the announcement of SQL Server 2022 being out now. So if you want to ask one of the questions, Spitfire, good to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. And it's especially because it's the nice, good timing for uh, European type classes now. Uh, so if you want to ask a question, don't do it over in YouTube or Twitch or Facebook chat. Make sure to do it up there at the URL up there. And then I'll go through your questions in the order that they were most highly voted. Starting with amazingly clueless one. Amazingly clueless one asks, I know, right? Like I love this. This I watched uh, that t the uh, Road Runner documentary this week. Was I immediately had to go and buy uh, a bunch of, uh, well, not a bunch, a couple of Anthony Bourdain t-shirts. Amazingly clueless one asks a really good question. He says, "Hi Brent, how do we increase concurrency in a high OLTP instance with a hundred plus databases running ten plus transactions on each of them in any given point in time?" Okay, the first thing that I would say is 10 transactions isn't actually a lot. Even in my mastering classes, we start with like 5, 10 transactions happening and go up to 200 transactions per second happening in the same database. 10 really isn't that many when you think even if all 10 are hitting the same entire table, you should be in uh, pretty good shape. Says, what I'm seeing is a lot of locking but not deadlocks. Am I missing anything that's trivial? So this is such a good question, and I cover it in my mastering index tuning, index tuning, query tuning, and server tuning classes three different ways. I'm going to give you the three different big picture ways. In mastering index tuning, we talk about having enough indexes to make your queries go fast, but not so many indexes that your queries are slow, because SQL Server has to grab locks across all these indexes to do these inserts and deletes. That's what we cover in mastering index tuning is what the right balance of indexes are and how to tell when you've got the wrong balance. You, you know you have the wrong balance because you're having blocking problems. And then how to go about tuning it to get a better number of indexes for your given workload. Second, in mastering query tuning, in mastering query tuning, we keep about, talk about keeping your transactions as short and sweet as possible. Think of it kind of like going to the grocery store. You would never go to the grocery store, go grab a cart, and then walk up to the front of the checkout, put your cart in there and go, all right, I'd like to begin my transaction now. If you'll excuse me, I need to go get some ice cream. And then you come back. Okay, next up, I got to get some ham. I'll be right back. You don't start your transaction until you have everything ready to go because the people in the grocery store line behind you would beat the daylights out of you. Nobody would be able to check out quickly. Go get everything that you need. Get all your data nicely lined up and do as little as possible during the transaction as you practically can. And we talk about how you tune transactions in mastering query tuning. And then in mastering server tuning, I talk about how the default isolation level read committed is usually the wrong one for most applications. And you're usually better off with either read committed snapshot isolation or snapshot isolation. And I talk about how you prepare your applications, how you prepare your servers, because there are changes that you have to make at the server level and at tempdb level uh, in order to prepare for those kinds of changes. So that gives you a rough idea of what's coming Covered. If you want to learn more about that, it just so happens that I'm running a sale this month. If you go over to brentozar.com slash Black Friday, uh, you can see deals that I've got going on my mastering classes, my fundamentals classes. This is the last year that you can attend live. If you want to attend my, uh, get my live class season pass and attend all my classes live for a year straight, this is the last year that you can do it. So you can read more about that over at brentozar.com slash Black Friday. And then welcome our newest subscribers here. We have Ian and Nelson BA81. So a warm round of applause there. Now let's come back over here. <laughs> See what we got next. Uh, Brent's Tasty Beverage next asks, I thoroughly endorse that. 
Brent's Tasty Burverge asks, uh, my friends feel that the announcements for Microsoft regarding SQL Server 2022 were relatively small. Uh, nothing groundbreaking or revolutionary. What are your thoughts? So I saw this yesterday or two days ago, and I was so excited that I was like, oh my God, I have to write an entire blog post about that. Because usually I'm the first person who will say that the emperor has no clothes, that Microsoft isn't, uh, isn't doing anything revolutionary. But I'm actually really excited about the direction that they're going in SQL Server 2022. It's so early, we can't really judge on execution. We can't really say how they did. But I think that people don't understand how hard those features were that they shipped. And I have a great deal of respect for it. And I, I don't think any of them are total turkeys. I, I may personally not use them, but at least I think that SQL Server is going in the right direction. Um, plus, remember, over the last three years, uh, 2020, 2021, it's amazing that we got a version at all out of these last couple of years. These last couple of years have been rocky. I know you haven't been productive. You've been sitting around watching YouTube videos. Next up, Arthur asks, we need to change a primary key column from integer to big int. There are half a billion rows in the table. There are no foreign key relationships. What would be the best strategy to make that change? The best strategy is to search my blog. They, I have a blog post about changing data types from small int to big int. Let me go Google real quick and see what it's called uh, so that I can give you the right thing to search for. So Brent Ozar change column int big int. Um, and it's, oh yeah, beautiful. So if, if you search for Brent Ozar altering data types with almost no downtime, I've got a video where I teach you how to do it using a technique that I saw from Gianluca Sartori out of Italy, also known as Spaghetti DBA. A brilliant database administrator, always fun to see him uh, speak, and he had a blog post about this, and I couldn't believe how few people knew about it. Uh, I certainly didn't know about it. It was a really slick trick involving compression, super slick. So search for uh, Brento's R video, altering data types with almost no downtime. Next up, we have Kevlar Powered says, uh, we know that the merge statement used to be less than ideal. <laughs> yeah, that's the understatement of the century. My friend says the merge statement has gotten even better in new versions, and I should use it for my ELT processes. Is it ready for prime time? Search on the web for Aaron Bertrand merge. So Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, Bertrand, Merge. And it gives you a list of things to look out for with the Merge statement. They're not fixed. I don't know where your friend is seeing that it got better in newer versions of SQL Server. That's simply not true. Microsoft hasn't put any significant effort into fixing the huge number of known issues that are out there with the Merge statement. This is where, you know, we just talked about SQL Server 2022, and we talked about how uh, is Microsoft going in the right direction. What we don't know about SQL Server 2022 yet is what they've been doing in terms of fixing bugs with things that are big known showstoppers. Um, it, this early in the release, of course, they're not, they're not going to be talking about bugs. They're going to be talking about big new features that they've added. So I think we're all excited to see if they've uh, shipped any improvements to things like that that are just known total crappers. Uh, stretch tables was another one where uh, they brought it out and then the pricing was so horrific that it just didn't make sense. The survey, you know, survey says whether or not they've actually fixed any of that stuff in SQL Server 2022. Next up, Fjord, Fyodor asks, uh, why is this year the last year in which you'll be doing live classes? Because I'm lazy. Because I want to work less. So I, I actually don't want to have my calendar chock full of stuff where I have to be at a specific place at a specific date and time. I like getting drunk, going out for a drive, goofing off, saving baby turtles on the beach. Uh, so it's it's my idea of a perfect schedule is to not have anything on my schedule. I'm like aiming for nothing on my schedule starting November of 2022. 
and being able to have the flexibility to do what I want when I want. I'll still work. I'm not retiring. I really love what I do, as goofy as that sounds. I just don't want it to be at a specific date and time. So what I'm going to do is focus more on building recorded classes and other material that you can buy that just won't involve me standing live in front of a camera at a specific date and time. Next up, we have Dogbert asks, I haven't seen that column in for that uh, comic in forever. Dogbert asks, hi, Brent, do you have any recommended scripts for identifying which tables may be nearing the upper bounds of their identity column? Yes, SP Blitz Index. SP Blitz Index, no additional parameters, just run it in the database of your choice, and it'll warn you when you're within, I can't remember if it's 15% or 20% of the values running out of a column. SP Blitz Index, bam, gives you all kinds of useful, insightful advice. How much would you pay for a script like that? $9? $19? But wait, there's more! It'll tell you when you have too many indexes on the same column. It'll tell you when you have duplicate indexes. It'll tell you when you have foreign key problems, null issues, all kinds of stuff. All for the low, low price of free, ladies and gentlemen. It is open source, and you would know all about it if you went to my class, How I Use the First Responder Kit. See, I don't blame you. The first responder kit has like about a dozen scripts in it all together, and they're so freaking powerful, and they do so many things that it's it's totally normal if people don't know everything that they do for you. Now, that's why I do that class, how I use the first responder kit to start to teach you some of those, because they're these are pretty big scripts, but SP Blitz Index. Next up, Sanjeev says, Hi Brent, we're creating non-clustered indexes on a six terabyte database, but some of them are created in a few minutes. One of them is running for more than a day, but still not completed. The SQL is using only 300 megabytes of 13 gigabytes. I don't know what that means. Um, please let me know how to create the indexes faster. Oh, sure, 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 sure. Okay. So I'm just, I'm going to do a brain dump of a bunch of things, just a bunch of, and it's not going to be in any kind of order, just a bunch of things that I would think about. Number one, is blocking involved? Is anybody else trying to run a statement against the same table at the same time? Two, how many columns are in the index? The more data that you're trying to write, the longer that it's going to take. Um, three, are you using max.dop hints? You can use max.dop hints when you create an index. It may be that the server's level of max.dop is only one. You can hint a higher number. If you want to use all the cores at once, for example, you can hint max.dop equals zero, and that'll go off and use all of the CPU cores at once. So there's all kinds of interesting stuff there that you can do. Um, the other thing to, to think about is what's the bottleneck stopping you from going faster? So what you can do is run SP Blitz Who. SP Blitz Who was kind of like SP Who is active, but it shows you the total wait time per session. Then you can go see what, what that session is waiting on uh, as it's going and building the indexes. That'll help give you an idea of whether it's a bottleneck on the read side or over on the write side. Next up, uh, Biggie DB says, hey, Brent and party people didn't spell my name right. Says Brett. Unfortunately, there's no one here named Brett. You're lucky that I'm a party person. Otherwise, you might not get an answer to that question. Uh, is it always a smart idea to use Maxdop one when building a clustered column store index? Oh, that's a great question. So the I bet that Biggie knows more than he communicated inside this question. What Biggie's kind of hinting at is that when you let a column store index build go parallel, the little row groups, up to a million rows in a row group, the little row groups aren't balanced equal or aren't aren't segmented well. Uh, the, the it makes it hard for SQL Server to do segment elimination. That's a really interesting question, and I, I spend about an hour on this in uh, Fundamentals of Column Store, my class Fundamentals of Column Store. And I'm going to give you kind of the punchline. If the table is relatively small, and I'm going to say less than like half a billion rows, then sure, you could use max stop one. The table isn't that large. It's going to you're going to get the clustered column store index created relatively quickly anyway. 
But as you get to real data sizes, you go up past half a billion rows, a billion rows beyond that. You can't wait for just one CPU core to build out those big objects. So instead, what you end up doing is partitioning the table. I'm not a really big fan of partition tables in most use cases, but I totally am in column store when we're talking about real data sizes, say half a billion rows per table or more. And that alleviates the problems with single threaded index rebuilds because you rebuild each index, uh, each partition on its own. Uh, next up, we have Socrates. <laughs> Socrates, I love it. Um, Socrates says, when we create an index, hello, uh, hey, Def, um, or Haeckel, uh, says, when we create an index on a high transactional synchronous always on replica, we get extensive blocking. Our app becomes unresponsive. Our Microsoft support recommends that we switch the replication mode to async during the index creation. Are there better options? You know, when you, uh, when you ask Microsoft support questions, sometimes they can't tell you that you're not wearing pants. Sometimes they have to be kind of politically correct with you. And so the thing that I bet they probably wanted to say and they couldn't say is, why are you hosting always on availability group synchronous replication on stone tablets? Often when I see people doing this, they're using older storage, slower storage, long network pipes in between the two replicas. And rather than try to get into the political battle of saying, hey, yo, stop using an Etch-a-Sketch to host SQL Server Enterprise Edition, they use the cheat way out and they say, hey, why don't you just go async while you're creating that? So the thing that I would suggest, too, is that's a good time to go give, give yourself a performance health check. Go see what kind of hardware you're really dealing with there. And remember that SQL Server Enterprise Edition is $7,000 a CPU core. Don't host Enterprise Edition, because I'm assuming you're probably doing Enterprise Edition with that. Don't host Enterprise Edition on the equivalent of like a laptop. If my laptop has faster storage, more memory, more CPU cores than your production SQL Server, that's when you start going, well, if you really want to fix it long term, go throw some hardware at that thing. Next up, Jay, the developer playing DBA says, what are your thoughts on scream testing index drops? What he means by that is he doesn't have the time, he or she doesn't have the time to uh, test or check everywhere that the index could possibly be used or like hard coded in uh, and wants to just drop it and see if anybody screams in pain. Says, I have several tables approaching 20 indexes, and many are not used using the SPBlitz index right to read ratio. Um, they probably supported something that no longer exists and are now zombies. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, given usually when you don't have enough people to go through and test every bit of your application, if you're seeing from SPBlitz index that there are no reads on that index across the span of weeks, then yeah, by all means, screen test it. Just make sure that you script out the index changes first, script out the indexes that you have already, that you're getting ready to drop. And SPBlitz index helps you with that too. If you scroll all the way over to the far right in SPBlitz index's output, there's an index creation script for each of the indexes. So you can copy paste that out and use that as your uh, undo script. Works really well. Next up, Matt says, hi, Brent, no question for me, only to say that the recent fundamentals and mastering classes have helped me massively in the last few days Woo to speed up numerous queries I didn't even know needed tuning. Yay. Oh, that's awesome. Good to hear. Very cool. Mm. Best one was a stored procedure going from two hours, 30 minutes to just under 20 minutes. You know, to really the whole reason that I focus on performance tuning these days, as opposed to doing traditional production DBA work, like uh, backups, index maintenance, etc. Um, make sure to read the thing up there about how to ask questions up there, just uh, FYI. Um, the, the whole reason that I focus on that stuff instead of doing traditional high availability and disaster recovery type work is that people are actually excited when you get done with your job. People are actually uh, high-fiving you in the hallway, so to speak. Whereas when I was a production DBA, even when I did everything flawlessly, nobody stopped in to say, hey, you're doing a great job. They just were like, well, of course the server works fine. What do we hire you for? It works just bulletproof. I'm like, that's not how technology works. 
Next up, SQL Padawan says, Hi Brent, I'm about to finish your mastering courses. I'll go through them and watch them and do the labs again. I'm wondering what's the common path of your students after finishing your courses? Is it changing careers, certification? May the force be with you. Wow, from the people that I talk to afterwards, the number one is they go to consulting. Not necessarily that they hang out their own hat or hang out their own sign that they're going to start doing consulting on their own because it's hard to go get uh, clients. Uh, but they often go to work for consulting companies because the knowledge that you gain from here makes you really stand out from other uh, target applicants. If you're able to say, here's exactly how you performance tune something, here's how I use free open source scripts in order to figure out what's going on with the server, you, you can really get a lot done more quickly and you make that company look sharper. So I know that a lot of consultant or a lot of folks who've gone through this end up going off into consulting or working for much larger companies too. Next up, Matthias says, Hi Brent, I inherited from the previous DBA a database with 16 data files because he thought that would increase performance without testing. Nice. How do you know if you have multiple files can have a benefits or disadvantage? The only one that I see is wasted space. So that, it's a really good question. And the problem is, let's say, just theoretically, and just to pick a number, let's say that this was making your writes 10% slower or your reads 10% slower, just to totally make up a number out of nowhere. What are you going to do about it? Are you really going to take all this big, huge work on of going and rebuilding indexes in order to, to get them down to as few data files as possible, doing shrink with empty data file operations? Or my other favorite technique is you go create a new uh, file group with just a couple files in it, and you rebuild indexes onto that uh, target. It's so much work. So before you would go and tackle all of that, what I would do is go, and I agree, it's probably not right. It probably doesn't make sense. Uh, but before I would go and tackle it, I would go look at what my SQL Server's top weight type was. And then that way, look at ways that I can solve that top weight type. For example, if you're CPU bottlenecked, that number of data files isn't going to help you at all. So just to give you perspective there. Uh, then Muppet1 asks, I'm going to shortcut yours to the top of the list because you did this what you were told. Woohoo! Um, says, hi Brent, I want to know what that LED grid thingy is on the wall behind you. That is Simone Yetch's everyday calendar. So every day that I uh, do what I'm supposed to do, today's the 8th, every day that I do what I'm supposed to do, I touch that and then it lights up, which is probably pretty hard to see uh, in a bright room like this. It works really well at night uh, and it just stays lit up all the time. So Simone Yetch, everyday calendar. Uh, she's the person who is the queen of crappy robots. I'm not going to swear on here, but uh, was the queen of crappy robots, built her own Tesla truck, etc. So that she did this really cool everyday calendar. Uh, and it's in the Museum of Modern Art now, which is kind of neat. I got one of the first hundred. She's down her little signature is down here. I got number 81. That's woo, fantastic. Uh, next up, Suresh asks, hi, Brent. My friend has a database that's about 800 gigs in size, and when he runs the estimates of CheckDB, the tempdb size needed is around half a terabyte. How could that be possible? Because you need space to do operations. And I always want to keep half a terabyte in perspective. I mean, half a terabyte isn't that large. My iPad has that much space. This is consumer electronics territory now. Stop freaking out over, you know, one terabyte worth of space. It's not as big as it used to be. So what is it that SQL Server is doing when it does CheckDB? It has to compare the contents of every index. It has to build indexed views. If you have indexed views, SQL Server has to go and check the contents of them. To do that, it effectively has to build them again. A lot of operations that can be space intensive. So if you want to try getting most of the benefits of CheckDB without needing so much space, check out the physical only switch for CheckDB. Physical only is a switch where SQL Server just reads the checksums of every 8K page, uh, and then that gets you at least some confidence that the storage isn't pooping the bed. 
It's still not as good as a full CheckDB, but at least you'll get some of the benefits without requiring any space. Just stop freaking out about something that's these days your phone can have half a terabyte of space. And then the last one, highly voted one that we'll take is from Mikkel from Denmark. Michael asks, how would you recommend upgrading the database compatibility level from 2014 to 2019 or maybe waiting to 2022? Um, I actually have a blog post about that. If you search for Brent Ozar uh, uh, compatibility level change, I have a blog post describing the strategy that I recommend with clients and here's what I do. Let's say that on a weekend you decide to upgrade from SQL Server 2014 to 2019. When you upgrade, leave the databases at the compatibility level where they are. I can't say that enough. It's so important. Leave. I don't even care if you did testing. Leave them where they are. Because when you do the upgrade, people want to play the blame game. Everybody wants to play pin the blame on the database administrator. They want to be like, hey, you know, I, everything was fine with this query yesterday, but now it sucks rocks. When you change the compat level, you are changing execution plans. And I want to make sure first that we're just only changing as few things as possible when we're doing upgrades. After a week or two, the blame game is going to die down. And people who have been like, I know, my query used to be amazing, but now it's slow. At least then you're not dealing with changing execution plans. You're dealing with other things, like they're just trying to play the blame game. After a couple of weekends, or a couple of weeks, then schedule an outage window. And I, I call any time I make a change to production, I call that an outage window, just because there are always risks when something happens. On a weekend, go do that alter compatibility level and roll everything forward to the newest supported compat level. And watch. Just watch the server for an hour or two. Sometimes the change can have uh, dramatic, ugly impacts on one or two particular queries. So you can use tools like SP Blitz Cache or Query Store to find the most resource intensive queries. If after the compatibility level change, you see a query or two that has just horrific different behavior, you can save its execution plans and then roll back to 2014 compat level. Then that way you can still go out and get drunk on the weekend. You don't have to worry about making emergency changes. And Monday morning when you're sober, you sit down at the keyboard with the rest of your team and say, this query has problems with compat level 2019. Let's figure out how we're going to reduce that blast radius. Or sometimes what you find when you flip over to 2019 is that lots of stuff has problems. And at least at that point, you can disengage and go back to 2014 and just kind of stay there for a while. But even if you test, never upgrade right away on the compat level. Leave it at your old compat levels and then only revisit that after a couple weeks when the blame game has died down. All right, there's we've been going for about uh, half an hour here, and I'm uh, now fully woken up from my nap. My uh, tasty beverage cup is empty here. I'm out of espresso, so time to go do something about that, and then time to also get some real work done. So I will call it quits here, go back to my day job, and uh, see y'all this week. I'm going to be speaking at the Quest Empower event. I'm speaking, the doing the keynote at the Pass Summit, the community keynote on Friday. So if you haven't registered for the Pass Summit yet. Uh, totally free this year. Both Quest and Power and the Past Summit are both totally free. Um, and if you like that stuff, <laughs> check out my Black Friday sale at Brentozar.com slash Black Friday. My training classes, SQL Constant Care, the Consultant Toolkit are all on sale 70 to 80 percent off. Enjoy. And that's the end of my sales pitch voice. So I will see y'all this week at Quest and Power at the Past Data Community Summit. And then uh, next week, we have a totally free Fundamentals of Column Store class. So I will see you in class. Adios, y'all.